I want to start the message, and I want to talk about being ready, being prepared today. Now, can you think of a time when you lost an opportunity because you weren't ready? Or maybe you failed at some kind of a test because you weren't really prepared? How many of you can look at a past situation and go, I wish I knew then what I know now? If only I would face that, now I would be ready and I would be prepared. So being prepared is important. All of us had times where we all of us had times where we wish we were ready and we wish we were prepared. So that's what we're going to talk about today. In Matthew 25, we're going to be there all morning long. Uh, if you want to turn there, Jesus tells a parable that is a story about being ready. And it's a story about ten bridesmaids, ten maids. And they are getting ready to welcome a groom into the wedding feast. And that was common at the time. The uh, bride and her party and the families, they would gather in the home or the, you know, wherever it was that the ceremony and the feasting was going to take place. And the groom and his party would make their way there, but they would have to stop in a number of homes of important people and leading people on their way to the wedding, and they'd be greeted and then released. And so they'd make their way and when they would get there, it would be dark. And so the uh, bridesmaids would be waiting with lamps to light the way and to welcome them into the wedding with great light and joy and power. So that's the background. Let's read Jesus' story. We'll read the whole thing together at once. Matthew 25, beginning with the first verse. Then the kingdom of heaven will be compared to or be like ten virgins or ten maids or bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil, or they took no extra oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Here is the bridegroom, go out to meet him. Then, the, then uh, all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and you if we give you some, you go rather to dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the feast, and, to the, and then the door was shut. And afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you or I do not accept you or approve of you. I mean, you're late. Watch there. And then here comes the, uh, the bottom line. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Now, I want to break this down and find out what does it teach us about being prepared or being ready? Let's start with the first verse. And we read there, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now I want you to notice that all of the bride, bridesmaids had good intentions. All of them wanted to welcome the groom into the party with great light and rejoicing. So they all equally had good intentions. How many of you know good intentions are universal? Almost everybody has good intentions. Every student at his high school graduation or his college graduation, every graduate has good intentions. They intend to succeed in life. They intend to do well. None of them intend to fail. None of them intend to make a mess of things or to go to jail or become a drug addict or an alcoholic or fail in any other way. Every couple standing at the altar has good intentions. They intend to live a lifelong relationship of love and respect and happiness. Every parent in a delivery room has good intentions. As they stand there and they look into the eyes of that baby and they intend to be the very best parent they can 
to never fail that child, to not make any mistakes, and to give them the very best life possible. Every person that comes forward in an altar call to give their life to Christ, their crusade, they all intend well. I want to tell you, without exaggeration, I have seen many, many, many thousands of young people at camps and future quests and different crusades and evangelistic outreaches that we've done. I've seen them at the front giving their life to Christ, often with their hands upraised and tears coming down their face. And every one of them intends to go from that point on and walk with God. But of course, it doesn't always work out that way, does it? Let me ask you, do you have good intentions? If you do, can I say congratulations? <laughs> and now can I say, well, you just look around this auditorium, just swivel your head and look around and realize that every person in here has good intentions. As a matter of fact, after church, you can go down to the mall, and you can walk around the mall, and I guarantee you almost every person in there would say they have good intentions, they mean well, they don't want to hurt the people they love, they don't want to fail, they have good intentions. Now, all ten of the bridesmaids had the same intentions, and they were good. But how many of you know, having good intentions is not the issue. That's not what determines how your life turns out. That's not what separates people. That's not what decides what the future is going to be. It's something else that decides that. And Jesus is going to, in this parable, tell us two very important things. So let's go to the next verse, and we're going to find one of those things is character. Verse 2. So five of them were foolish and five were wise. So that's a difference in character. Five were foolish, five was wise. Can I tell you that you have absolutely no control over the circumstances of your birth? Which family you're born to, how much money you're born into, you know, where, where, what city you're born into. You have no control over those cards that you're dealt, but you have control over your character. You see, that's on you. That's on me. And your character, that's what's decisive about how your life turns out. Now, the second thing that separated them, it wasn't their intentions. The second thing, we'll find the next two verses, and it was their preparation. Verse 3 through 4. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil or extra oil with them. But the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. So they differed in their preparation. Some prepared themselves and some did not. And so after 40 years in the ministry, I can tell you that what separates people is not their intentions. What separates people is their character and their preparation. So let's look at the first thing, their character. In this sense, we're talking about the difference between wisdom and foolishness. I spent a lot of time over the years thinking about wisdom and foolishness. And over the years, I've come up with three definitions. And I'm going to share those three definitions with you in the next few minutes. What is wisdom? First definition. Wisdom is the understanding and skill to live life successfully. Wisdom is the understanding of skill to live life successfully. Now, people chase after knowledge. Our colleges are filled. Our universities are filled. People are chasing after knowledge. Unfortunately, what often passes for knowledge is not true. It's not scientific. It's corrupted by all ideology. But I want to tell you that even so, wisdom is greater than knowledge. Wisdom is more important. It's more relevant to your life. It's more decisive. Let me give you a little humorous uh, definition of the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is knowing that tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in a fruit salad. It's <laughs> a good definition. Kind of makes it clear. Now, wisdom is what prepares you to succeed in life. Let me give you my second definition. Wisdom is knowing what to do, and just importantly, 
when to do it. Now, wisdom is leaning not upon your own understanding, but yielding to a greater understanding, which is God's understanding. So wisdom means seeing it his way and doing it his way. Wisdom is the willingness to always turn to the Bible first to find out the truth or to find out the answer to why something is or how we should live. Psalm 111.10, we read these words. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So fear or reverence of God is the starting point to being wise. Let me give you the third definition. Wisdom is living in such a way that you are surrounded by God's blessing and favor. Now, what do I mean by that? The same God that created the physical world is also a moral being who created the moral dimension of life. And just as there are laws in physics and laws in the physical world that you must follow to succeed, so there are laws in the spiritual and moral world that you must follow in order to have success. Now, how many of you guys know that the same wind that will speed you in a sailboat to your destination if you are sailing with the wind will also impede you tremendously if you sail against the wind? And so wisdom is living according to God's rules and God's design so that life works for you instead of against you. So what is foolishness then? Well, it's the opposite. Foolishness is ignoring God's commands and it's ignoring his ways. Foolishness means leaning on your own understanding or your own perceptions and insisting on your own way. How many of that's foolishness? Foolishness is choosing to follow the philosophies and the teachings and the ideas of this current age that's always changing instead of building on the unchanging word of God. Now, you are born neither wise or foolish. We choose that. Now, in our story, the, there were five bridesmaids that were called wise. Now, why were those called wise as opposed to the other ones? The reason is because they prepared in case things didn't go the way they planned. And so they brought extra oil. Part of wisdom is acknowledging the fact that life will not always go the way you plan or the way you hope. In fact, it won't go that way very often at all. Life doesn't go that way. Life often throws you curveballs, and life often blindsides you. Can I tell you that few things worked out in my life the way I planned? And uh, often that was a very good thing. <laughs> if I could just talk about ministry, or if we'll call it my career, just that slice of life, just take that as an example. The first church I ever served, I was a young man. It was in La Mesa. And I had plans and dreams at that church. But I got called away with Dave to the Midwest to go to seminary. And when we were at seminary, we started a citywide youth ministry there. And we also uh, <clears throat> were thinking, we, we were dreaming about starting a church. I mean, we were ready to stay there. We had plans. But they didn't work out the way we planned. So I came back here and finished seminary, and I was working at a church on... Um, call in the college area, and I was all in. And Lynn and I, we prayed, and we had plans, and we had dreams, and despite those plans, and despite those dreams, they didn't work out. Now, every time that my plans didn't work out, I was discouraged. And yet, I trusted God anyway. And things, of course, worked out better than I could have ever hoped. See, if any of those other plans and dreams had worked out that Dave and I had, there wouldn't be a Foothills Christian Church. There wouldn't be Foothills Christian Schools. There wouldn't be youth ventures. Uh, we wouldn't have had 
Christians in city government here in El Cajon or on the school board. There wouldn't have been the huge impacts that we've seen in Cuba and in uh, uh, Kenya and in Uganda. You see, God has a better plan. So I'm going to tell you something right now that you should write down because this is why you came to church. This is something you want to take out of here. Here it is. Making plans is essential. It's important. But developing trust in God for when things don't go as planned is even more important. I think everybody ought to have a plan for their life. You ought to plan things out. But there's something far more important than that, and that's the ability to trust God when things don't work out the way you plan because that's where you're going to spend an awful lot of your life, dealing with the unplanned and the unexpected. When things don't go the way you thought, or it takes a lot longer than you thought. Now, people often think they're prepared, but here's the key. They're only prepared if things go just exactly the way they planned that they would. Now, if you'd ask these five bridesmaids, the foolish ones, if they were prepared, they would have said yes. They had their lamp. They had oil in their lamp. They arrived at the meeting place on time. They were prepared as long as the brides, the uh, groom came in the time of their, their planning. But it didn't work out that way, did it? He was delayed, verse 5. And as the, bridegroom, as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and they slept. So they weren't prepared for the delay and they grew weary and they fell asleep and the oil in their lamps burned out. They weren't prepared for the delay. Life is full of delays and disappointments and fatigue and and the difficulties, and I, I will tell you something, and that is that life, things will rarely go as easily as you hope or as you plan. Now, all the old people of my age could say a hearty amen to that. <laughs> but if you're young, I want to tell you, learning that lesson is a difference between being naive and being experienced or having experience. So that, what that means is that part of preparation is that you have to develop the ability to persevere through difficulties and delays and disappointments. Hebrews 10.36, we read this. <clears throat> For you have need of the ability to endure. You have need of endurance so that when you've done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. You see, the promise is certain. But you have to be able to endure through disappointments and delays and all those things until you arrive there. Now, the five foolish bridesmaids, with all their good intentions, they found out what so many people today find out, that enthusiasm and excitement and good intentions often leave you short. It takes something more. Now, when you're young, you have energy and enthusiasm and dreams. And that is a wonderful thing. That's a wonderful thing to have. But what you don't have yet is experience. And so can I encourage you, don't only hang out with your peer group. Spend time with people who have experience, who can help you to learn. Now let's get back to our story Verse 6 through 9, now Matthew 25, 6 through 9. But at midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom, he's finally come. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and they trimmed their lights. They fired those suckers up. And the foolish said to the wife, uh-oh, we don't have any oil. Give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, you go rather to the dealers and buy it for yourself. Finally, at midnight, the moment they'd been waiting for came. And oftentimes, the moment you've been waiting and praying for comes after a long delay. 
Now, let's go back and let's remember how this evening began. The ten maids, they all arrived the same. They had their lamps. They were excited. They were full of joy and anticipation. You know what I found out? I found out you can't always tell from the wedding photos what the marriage is going to be like. I've never seen wedding pictures that weren't beautiful, where everyone wasn't happy and laughing and excited. But how many of you know a lot of marriages don't end well? And I'll tell you something else. When people come out of the baptismal water, they almost all come out beaming because it's a spiritual experience. And they all intend to be great Christians, but not all of them end up being overcoming Christians. When it came time to light the lamps, the five were out. They were unprepared. And the foolish wanted to get more oil from the wise. But how many of you know there are some things you just have to get for yourself? Can I say that again? There are some things that nobody else can give you. You have to get them, and you have to have them yourself. For instance, there comes a time when you can't live on your parents' faith anymore. There comes a time when relying on your wife or your husband's faith, and they're the spiritual ones, and they say the prayer, that's not enough. There's a time when it's not enough to rely on your pastor's faith. There's a time when it's not enough to go to a great church that's filled with people who have faith. There there comes a time when you stand or fall by your own faith. There comes a time when when you're either wise or you're foolish. There comes a time when you're either prepared or you're not prepared. Verse 10. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. I like, to say that, I like to say that opportunities have an expiration date. No opportunity lasts forever. One day comes, and the door is shut, and the opportunity is gone. It's lost. Michael Johnson was an American sprinter. He won four gold medals. He set uh, a number of world records. He was the world champion eight years he won eight world championships. And at the time of his, in his prime, he was considered the fastest man in the world. Now, he was also a pretty good philosopher. And I read something that he said, I read it years ago, and it stuck with me forever. He said, people will tell you that life is not a sprint, it's a marathon. How many of you guys have heard that? Life's not a sprint, it's a marathon. He said, I think those people aren't really correct. He said, I think life is a lot more like a sprint. Now listen to this. It's months and even years of training and preparation so that you can perform in a brief moment of opportunity. It's just 100 yards. And you train and you train and you train. So when the gun goes off and you've got that brief opportunity, you make it. Now how many know that's really how life is? We have these brief moments. You know, people talk about the importance of um, uh, life-defining moments. We call them defining moments in life. (laughs) And people talk about those ever since then moments, those life-defining moments, and how important they are. But let me tell you, life-defining moments do not determine who you are. Here's what they do. Life determining moments reveal your level of preparation because if you are prepared and that life defining moment comes then you'll make the right choice you'll pass you'll get the blessing but if you're unprepared you'll fail it and you'll suffer whatever consequences there might be let me ask you a question what are you doing to prepare yourself For those moments and those challenges and those opportunities and those tests and those temptations that are out there just waiting? Do you have a plan for your personal growth, 
for your spiritual growth, for your preparation. Let me tell you the very first place that has to start. It's got to start with a devotional life. With a regular time of opening the Bible, <clears throat> meditating on the scriptures, studying the Bible, reorning your mind regularly to the way the Bible sees it against a torrent of worldly thinking and garbage that comes at us. Devotions in which you make every need known to God and receive his peace so you don't stress. Devotions in which you wait until God wants to bring something to your mind or speak to you, put your heart on something. You'll never be more on the outside than you are on the inside. And you become who you are by spending time with God and in his truth and with his spirit. And then you're going to want to do something beyond that. You're going to want to increase your vision and your skills. So you read some books. Maybe you listen to some podcasts. And perhaps most importantly, you spend time with people who inspire you and who enlarge you and who equip you. Do you believe that God is good? And do you believe he has good plans for you? Because people who believe that, they plan for the future. And the first way you prepare is by being faithful for, with what you have. You might say, I don't have that much. But the way you move forward is you are faithful with what you have. And then God gives you more. Now, we always prayed here as a church since, since we first met the first Sunday. We always prayed that God would use us as an instrument of great influence. That he give us res uh, responsibilities to do good in our community, to make an impact, to really make changes in the East County. And one day years ago, uh, our staff, I don't remember all of us or some of us were there, but <clears throat> we were with the man that I respected, and he asked us a question. He said, you know, God could give you El Cajon, God could give you East County, but what would you do with it? <laughs> and it hit me. It struck me. And we realized that God wouldn't give us responsibility and influence. He wouldn't give that to a bunch of people that weren't prepared to handle it and didn't have a plan. And so it changed how we began to look at everything. And we began to pursue growth. And we began to uh, pursue uh, learning more and new skills and thoughts and personal preparation. You see, God will not make you a steward of anything that you haven't prepared and planned for. He doesn't give you something that you have no skills or no vision or no expectation or no training for. Now, the future is always unknown. And in this parable, there were 10 bridesmaids, and they were peering into an unknown night, into an uncertain night. Nobody knew what that night would bring, just like none of us know what tomorrow will bring. Five failed, and they were shut out. Five were prepared, and they entered in. Now, ultimately, this parable is about the return of Christ for his bride, the church. That's what it's ultimately about. Let's read the last two verses. And afterward, the other virgins came also, the ones that didn't have, that weren't wise and didn't have the oil, and they came saying, Lord, Lord, open the door to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you, or I do not recognize you, or I do not approve of you. I mean, you're late. You're not getting in, in other words. You missed a moment. And then here is, if you will, the overall message. Watch, therefore, for you do not know the day or the hour. That is, you do not know the day or the hour when the Lord is coming. You see, this parable ultimately <clears throat> is about being prepared for when Jesus Christ comes calling for you, whether it's when he returns to earth or when he comes to you at the moment of death, which can be any moment. It's about being prepared for that. The Bible says that one day Christ is going to return and that believers will join him in the air and that he'll take us to be with him forever and the others will be left behind. You know, people, some people, especially secular people, they have a really hard time 
uh, with the idea that Christ is just going to appear in the sky. He's just going to He's just going to show up, put, there he is, and we're all going to meet him. And they think that sounds unlikely. Can I tell you what's really unlikely, what re- would have been really hard to believe? In fact, nobody could believe it. It's that the creator of the whole universe would be born as a little baby in an animal's feeding trough, a manger, in a barn. That's way more unlikely. And I want to tell you, if he literally did that the first time and fulfilled prophecy, you can be sure he's going to come back the second time just the way he said. Yeah, give him a hand. And he wants to be sure that we're ready. Now, the maids all had their opportunity to enter, but some were unprepared. And to them, the Lord said, truly, truly, I don't know you. Now, if you don't know the Lord, then you're unprepared to meet him. You're unprepared for when he comes calling, either when he returns to earth or when he comes calling to you in your death. So do you know him? Have you been born again? Have you surrendered your life to him as your Lord and Savior? I'm not asking, did you come from a Christian family? It doesn't matter if your grandpa was a pastor It doesn't matter if you've always gone to church. It doesn't matter if you belong to a great church. Because there's just certain things in life you can't get from somebody else. You have to make that decision. It's not enough to be close. It's not enough to be around people who love the Lord. Have you asked Christ in your heart? Have you asked him to forgive you of your sins and to come in? and to be your Lord, and to direct your life, and to change it. So many people get completely distracted and consumed by the affairs of life. See, first you got to get an education, well, check that box. You got to have a social life, you know, you got to have your time on social media, so we'll check that box. And then you have to have a career, check. Then you have to have a girlfriend, check. Then you have to get married, check. Then you have to get a house checked. Then you have to get kids checked. Then you have to take those kids to soccer. You got to take them to ballet. You got to take them to band practice. You got to take them. You got to take them. You got to take them. Check, 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 check. (laughs) Then you got to go on vacations. Check. Then you got to pay for their education. Check. Then you got to go on more expensive vacations. Check. Then you got to pay for retirement. Check. And everybody checks all the boxes. But the one essential thing, the most important thing, Um, calling or assignment in this life is to be made right with God, to be reconciled with God through Jesus Christ and to be prepared for eternity. And a lot of people never get around to that box. I want to tell you a true story that's pretty amazing. It really is true. A man named Ivan McGuire and uh, his dream was to be a uh, videographer of skydivers. He made over 800 jumps. And he was, that was his career. He was a videographer of sky jumpers. And let me tell you about the last jump he ever made, his last video. There he was, he set the whole thing up, that was his job. Made sure he had the pilot, check. Made sure the plane was ready to go and, and uh, gassed up, check. Make sure all the people had all their forms filled out. Check, check, make sure they had all their equipment. Check, make sure he had the camera. Check, make sure he had enough film. Check, checked all the boxes. And when you watch the video, he shoots all this party that's going to be doing this together. He shoots them, and there's people laughing. They're having a great time. They're on the ground. And then he shoots them in the air, and they're laughing in in the plane. And then there's beautiful footage as they go out the door and they jump. There's beautiful footage as he's going down with them and he's photographing them as they're going down and then as they open up their parachutes and then all of a sudden the camera jerks wildly because he it's, it's at that moment that he realized there was one box he didn't check. He actually jumped out without a parachute. Now that seems amazing, but that's how many people are living life. Muhammad Ali died less than three years ago. During his prime, it was said that he was the most famous and most recognized person on earth. 
In other words, they did surveys. They showed people pictures in all the different continents. And it was Muhammad Ali that was recognized more than anyone else. He was loved. He was famous. He was celebrated. He was chosen by Sports Illustrated magazine as the sportsman of the century. And yet, do you know that today he would trade all of that to have what you have right now? The opportunity to accept Christ. The opportunity to plan your life and to plan for eternity. I'm not trying to slam on, on him, but we have no reason to think he ever gave his life to Christ. We know that he made a, um, a decision to follow uh, or to, at some point with Islam. I don't know how closely he adhered to that. But all the famous people, you know, you think about Michael Jackson. He made that uh, film, uh, that uh, thriller, sold 26 million copies. The Beatles, more records sold than anyone else. The famous people. And how many of those people would trade places, everything they ever had. They'd trade everything they ever had for what you have to be in your chair and to be ready to prepare their life, to live it different, to live with wisdom, and to be prepared for the future. I'm going to show you a, a picture here. It was a, it's called The Light of the World. It's by a famous, famous painter named Holman Hunt. He painted at the turn of the last century. And um, this is his famous painting, and when it was unveiled, and uh, his friends were there and art critics were there. One of his friends said to him, Holman, you haven't finished the painting. See, this is painting based on Romans, excuse me, Revelation 3.23, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And he said, I finished the painting. He said, that's the door to the human heart. And there is no handle on the outside. It can only be open from the inside. See, every one of us has a decision to make about whether it be wise or foolish, what we're going to do with Jesus Christ. But once we make that decision, that decision will determine the rest of our life for better or worse and into eternity. If you've never given your life to Christ today and you do it, <clears throat> then your life will change and you'll never have to be afraid of death anymore because you know at the moment of death, Jesus Christ is going to take you home. I want you to think about it if you've never accepted Christ, whether you're ready to do that today. Maybe you've been around it. Maybe you've tried to stay near to it. Maybe you thought, I'll do it someday, but maybe today is your day. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. <clears throat> I'm not afraid of the future or death because I know that God is going to be faithful to every promise that he's put in his book. God wants you to have that same certainty. So I'm going to say a prayer. <clears throat> and if you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to today be forgiven, and you're willing to surrender your life to Christ and let him change your life and direct your life, and you're willing to say, from now on, Lord, it's your will, I want you to pray this prayer with me. Just, you can pray it silently, these words. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Lord, I'm asking right now, I'm saying that I want his death on the cross to pay the penalty for my sin so that I can be forgiven, so that I can be restored to a full relationship with you, so that I can be forgiven of all sins and Right now, I'm asking Jesus Christ to come in and sit on the throne of my heart and to direct my life in a new direction from here on. Come fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new. In Jesus' name, amen.